Uh, welcome to the channel again. If you're watching this, please subscribe so you can see what else I'm going to show. Uh, today, this video is going to be replacing the brake drum, the brake shoes, wheel bearings in and out, the wheel seal, the races for the wheel bearings. I'm also changing the slack adjuster, but to do that I have to change the S-cam because the spines are different on each one and what happens is right now this truck has manual adjusting slack adjusters which means it takes a 9 16 wrench to adjust the brakes and what I'm putting on is a self adjusting slack adjuster which takes two tools a lot of people will use a screwdriver to pull what they call the button out and then a 5 16 wrench to do the adjusting and without the screwdriver or the special tool that's supposed to be used to pull that button out you cannot back the brakes back off after you tighten them down to back them off a quarter turn and what prompted this whole project is I wanted to rebuild the steer axle on this 1988 Kenworth T600 for a couple years now and I've been buying the parts here and there and what I did is I called Kenworth and got the part numbers and when I had the money, I would just go buy this or that. So I finally came up with brand new brake drums for both sides, brake shoes for both sides, uh, new kingpins bushing set, all, all that stuff. Plus we're changing the uh, brake chamber. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to get new S cams, but I have a parts truck that is an 89. And the S cams for the brakes were good on that. And the S cam slack adjusters for the brakes were the automatic ones. So I went ahead and pulled those parts off of that truck and I'm putting them on this one. Those parts were good, but it helped having the other truck because I was able to take the brake shoes and brake drums and turn the brake shoes in for cores and get the other brake shoes so I had all the parts here unfortunately because if you watched any of my other videos you'll know about my health conditions so unfortunately it's taken me a while to be able to get all the parts and it's taken me a lot longer to do this job than it should honestly if you start early in the morning by sunset you should be able to have all the kingpins done both sides the wheel bearings the brake drums the brake shoes the S cam, the slack adjuster, the brake chamber, all that should be able to be done in one day if you're in good enough condition to do it. Unfortunately, I have not been, and plus yesterday it rained, so I lost yesterday anyways. But because of the way I've been feeling, it took, I did the other side already, and it took me four days to do that, unfortunately, because I can't work steady like I used to. But I'm going to show on this side, this is the hard side because this is the driver's side. Uh, the other side you didn't have uh, one steering component which is the uh, drag link. And I'm not changing the drag link at this pr present time. I have a brand new one, I have brand new, brand new tie rod ends but I'm working in, I'm on the process of working on getting an in frame done on this truck. I'm not going to be the one doing it, I'm going to have somebody else do it. And when they do it, I'm going to be taking them down to their shop in Jackson, Georgia to HD Truck Repair. And after they get the in frame done, then I'll have them do a front end alignment. So like the weekend before I take it down for that in frame, that's when I'll change the drag link and the tie rod ends. Because once you change the tie rod ends, unless you have an alignment machine or, or you know how to do the tape measure and and all that and you are on a level surface to do it you're not going to get your alignment right I mean you you got to know what you're doing to try and do it on a level surface without a machine but I don't have a level surface to work on I don't have a smooth surface to work on so I'd rather just do it the weekend before I take it down for the in frame let them put it on the machine get it right but like I said today is going to be a slack adjuster brake chamber king pins brake drum, brake shoes, inner and outer wheel bearings with races, and it's going to be a wheel seal. And to be open and honest, uh, 
I had some problems on the other side so before I started this video I went ahead and broke some bolts and stuff loose that I knew I was going to have problems with so it's going to come apart easier than it normally would but also I figure you have enough common sense to know how to take the tires on and off so I didn't need to show you how to do that and I'm a, you should have enough common sense once you get it the tire off make sure it's on a jack stand so you're working safely so anyways uh, today I've got a tripod set up with the cell phone I actually went and bought a GoPro but I haven't been able to figure that out uh, the IT department i.e. Kaylee uh, she's going to try and figure out how to get that set up I bought one of those headsets so to make it easier for you guys to see what's going on but anyways let's go ahead and start getting this all tore apart and let's find out what we're going to have here first thing i'm going to do is go ahead and get the brake drum off as you can see it's it's ready to come off we've already backed the brakes off there we go. once you back the brakes off it's not that hard to go ahead and get the drum off. now i am going to be disappearing uh, for a second or two and i'm going to show you why I, i'm going to keep disappearing for a few seconds uh the that bus up there i'm going to be walking back and forth to it because that's where i have all the tools in the back of the bus from doing the other side so every time i need a tool i'm going to be walking up there and get them. Uh, now to take brake shoes off i do the same on front or rear I just take a, a pry bar like this and I come in to the uh, spring. And one thing about big trucks, they're in, on the steers, most of the time they only have two springs, one on each side. On the drives, you're normally gonna have three springs, but it doesn't matter drives, steers, or even trailers. I just take this pry bar, I stick it in there against the spring where it hooks into the brake shoe, and I hit it to get it to pry bar between the brake shoe and the spring and as long as you got it angled properly so it goes down and catches the hook of the spring most of the time a few hits and it'll go ahead and pop the spring out just like that so that's the easiest way I've ever found of getting these shoes off and once you get that one spring off getting the shoes off it's not a big deal you just go ahead and flip it around it falls off both sides. That's how easy it is to get the brake shoes on. Now, the next thing is going to be getting the, this hub off. And a lot of times, it's not that hard. What you do is, there's a carter pin here on this older style. And you just go ahead and get the carter pin out. And like I mentioned before, I've already loosened some bolts up and nuts. So it'd be easy to get off. So then I just, I've already loosened this one up. I stuck the carter pin in so you guys can see where it goes and where it comes from. And you just go ahead and take this off, this nut off. Now today is Wednesday. Uh, chances are the, this video will not be there uploaded until next week because more than likely uh, I'm not going to finish this today. So this video is probably going to be today and tomorrow. I mean, it's already after 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So, what? hopefully I'll have the GoPro for tomorrow. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead when I'm at the Cancer Center Tuesday. I'll probably be editing this video. I got another editing program. Hopefully it works out better than the other one did. But that's why this video won't be up before next week. So you just shake that, the bearing, and the nut. Normally just pops out. Sometimes you can just grab this hub and it'll pull off. Like that. But not all the time. Sometimes you have a hassle. But surprisingly, this one came out fairly easy. Now, the other side when I pulled it apart, the outer bearing physically fell apart in my hand. So I knew that we had a problem there.
plus the race was all chewed up. Well, this race here, taking my bare finger, running it inside the race, it don't feel bad. But I'm gonna be changing them anyways because I've got brand new ones. Now the other side, uh, what I had to do to make the new bearings fit, I had to take some emery cloth and here where the outer bearing rides and here where the new bearing or the inner bearing rides, I had to actually sand both of those places down because the bearings did not quite want to fit. We're only talking maybe a thousandth or two, not much, but they need to be able to slide on and off fairly easy, but not be so loose that they wobble. And they didn't want to slide on without beating them on, so I went ahead and sanded the other side down to make them fit. Now, we're done with this hub for right this second. I'm just letting some of the oil drain into the drain pan. The next thing I'm gonna be doing is these bolts here and here, I'm gonna be taking them out and that's gonna get the backing plate off after I get the S cam off. Now, to get the S cam off, it's not gonna to be too hard. There's a little clip on the back that I've already loosened up and I'll be able to just use my hand to go ahead and pull that off and I'll show, you, show it to you. Sometimes they have the clip that we have on this one and sometimes they're like a snap ring where you use snap ring pliers. Now the one that's in here right now has one kind of clip. Now the S cam that I'm putting in is this one here. And on the end here, there's a little groove where the snap ring, where I use snap ring pliers, will put a snap ring on here to hold in place. So right now, I'm gonna go ahead and pick the phone up and show you where that clip is on the back side so you guys can see it. Now let me see. Okay, this is the clip I'm talking about. These clips can be a real pain in the rear to get off. You have to just get them just right to get them off. But like I said, I worked with this one and got it loose where it just pulls off. And then you got some uh, washers that you need to get off. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the hammer, I'm gonna tap on the S-cam to get it moving. See how it just goes ahead and starts moving. Now, we can come back out here and you see the S-cam right here. Now, once that's off, it just pulls right out, just like that. Okay? It's not hard to get them out once you get the brake shoes off and get that clip off the back. Now, this S-cam, I'll never use it again. I'll throw it in my scrap pile for the iron. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause it because, like I said, these bolts here, i got to take all of them off. And then once I get them off, this whole piece will decide to come off. And it will come off with the S-cam housing. Now, one thing I'm going to show you is if I can get the camera set up right. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and pull the slack adjuster off because the slack adjuster is going to just add weight to everything. So we're going to go ahead and take the slack adjuster off. We're going to go ahead and take the brake chamber off of that bracket. That's going to lighten it up. Now, like I said, I've done a few things. There's uh, another quarter pin here that I've worked loose where I pulled out my hand. And then this pin, I didn't work with this pin before. I just got, went ahead and soaked it up with BB Blaster and left this set for a few minutes. But this pin just is supposed to pull right out. And then the slack adjuster, the one that I'll never use again, is right there. Uh, now I've had to actually use a air hammer and I've actually had to cut those pins a ton because they wouldn't come out. Now, these are uh, 15 sixteenths, and like I said, I have loosened some things up, including these bolts here. But before you take all these bolts off, you want to come back here to where the hose is, and while it's still attached to something that makes it solid, you want to go ahead and get this hose off, because that's going to make it a whole lot easier on you. So, I mean, it's not that difficult. 7 8 inch, if it swivels, 
great. Uh, sometimes I've actually had to take this uh, brake chamber off and spin the brake chamber because the swivel on the hose was froze up. Well, in all fairness, I soaked it with BB Blaster before I started this video also. So it actually comes loose. So just take the hose off. Sometimes you get it almost off and then he wants to give you a hassle. So sometimes you just got to take it all the way with a wrench. And like I said, I've actually had a lot of this stuff, like these nuts, loose. So they'll come off. And the brake chamber will come off. And, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this brake chamber. But I'm rebuilding the steer axle. So it wouldn't make a lot of sense to go through all this and not put new brake chambers on here. I mean, this truck sat for 10 years. It was abandoned for 10 years before I got it. And then I worked on it for two years just to get it to where it'd run up and down the road. So I don't know how long all this stuff has been on this truck. So it, I'm going through all this anyways. I'm right here at the brake chambers and it's not hard to replace the brake chambers. I mean, the hardest part is cutting the threaded rod, if it's a threaded rod type. Some are not. Some trucks actually have what is called a welded clevis. And there's the brake chamber. Uh, something I'll never use again. So, you'll go in the scrap pile too. So, now is when I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. Because it's going to get real noisy because of these eight bolts that I showed you that I'm going to take off to get this plate off. After I get this plate off, then I'll start the video back up and we'll start on the kingpins. I mean, I'm doing all this stuff because to do the kingpins, you got to work with the spindle. Less stuff that's on the spindle, less weight, easier it is to work with. Because these spindles are not light and you've got two steering arms on this one. You got where the tie rod end goes and where the drag link goes. Yeah, you could take them off, but chances are taking them off. And if you're going to reuse them, you have a chance of messing up the boots. And you're going to wind up with a lot of dirt and grime and road stuff in there. And it's going to destroy their arm. So I'd rather not take them off if I don't have to. And like I said, I am going to be replacing them, but I don't want to have to do it before it goes down for the end frame so we're not going to take them off today okay I got all the bolts out of the backing plate so the backing plates ready to come off and then we'll be able to start working to get the kingpin out so let me put my gloves on here and I'll go ahead and give that backing plate a yank and as you can see all the bolts are out so once the bolts are out it normally just pulls off. If you have to, you might have to tap it on the back side with a hammer. But other than that, it just comes off that easy. And we're just going to roll it out of the way for right now because we're not messing with it now. Chances are we probably won't mess with it today. So it's out of the way. Now, the uh, kingpin. This bolt right here that my finger's on it's actually a wedge bolt. Uh, some of these trucks have one, like this truck has only one wedge bolt for the kingpin. And what that does, it keeps the kingpin from rotating once it's in there. It keeps the kingpin in place. So the spindle rotates and it's supposed to rotate on the kingpin. The kingpin is not supposed to rotate in the axle. The kingpin, you don't want it turning at all. That's the reason for the wedge pins. And, or bolts and normally they come out fairly easy so we're going to hope this one does this bolt here like I said is called a wedge bolt and sometimes you get lucky and you just hit them with an in, the nut like that and the nut comes off now in a good kingpin set you're going to get new wedge bolts but just in case there's the issue, like on the other side, the new wedge bolt did not want to go in, so I had to use the old one. 
So just to be on the safe side, put the nut back on so you don't mess up the threads in case you have to use it. And you just go ahead and hit it. This one's going to be a bit of a pain. As you can see, it's not one to cooperate real well. So, you go ahead and use the nut to get it as far as you can. You always prefer the thing to come out easy. But, like I said, sometimes it don't, and this one's not cooperating too well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a punch, try and find the center of the bolt, so I don't mess the threads up, and drive it out with a punch. And like I said, this one, it's not cooperating. I might wind up messing this bolt up. Because it definitely doesn't want to come out of there. Yep, there it went. It just fell out. Now, let's find out if I messed up the threads. Uh oh, I better clean it up a little bit before I try and put the nut back on. But it definitely did not want to play nice and come out. And cleaning it up. Uh, yeah, I messed up the threads. Chances are I'm probably not going to be able to use this one. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I messed the threads up too bad uh off camera i'll see if i can straighten it out because i know that one will go in the new one on the other side it didn't want to go in so i had to put the old one back in now the next thing you want to do is there's a plate on the top and the bottom of the kingpin this plate here is identical to the other side and these bolts here, I already loosened up. You take them off, and then seeing how you got the wedge bolt already out, you should be able to drive the kingpin down out. Hopefully, if it's not called it up, it'll be easy. But I've already loosened these up, as you can see, because the other side I had trouble getting off. So I went ahead and got these loosened up. And the new kingpin set will come, if you get a good one now, will come with these new bolts and new plates. Now you'll have to reuse the grease fitting or zerk fitting. Uh, or if you have new ones, you can always put a new one in. But I try and use the old ones because everything nowadays costs money, as everybody knows. So I try and use the old ones because Grease fittings don't normally wear out. They'll plug up, but usually you can clean them out. But if they plug up, then I change them. But these were taking grease before I started this job. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll take these pl plates and take the grease fittings out. Now, like I said, I took the bottom one out. And this is the bottom one. That's all it is, just a flat plate, three holes with a grease fitting. Uh, now I had to use a hammer and a, a uh, chisel to get that one to come off, but it did come off. Okay, up until this year, I usually did not worry about grease and wearing gloves and that. But because of the chemo, I actually am more sensitive to temperatures and things like that. And I've noticed that I get cut up a whole lot easier. And... I still blame DeKalb County Medical, Emory Hospital, and Grady because if they would have done what they were supposed to do back in 2018, I wouldn't be going through chemo. And I've tried to get lawyers, but to actually get them to change some kind of policy so this, it don't happen to somebody else. But I guess all the lawyers are scared of the hospitals because all the lawyers I called, none of them will take the case. All right, well... Let's go ahead and see how easy this plate is to get off. There it is. Plate's off. Throw it in the drain pan. It's done. Like I told you, here on the spindle on the other side, 
I had to use emery cloth to sand them down. It took me a couple hours to do that. So I want to try and get as much part as I can. Uh, tomorrow morning I'll come out, I'll test the bearings. More than likely I'll have to sand this down and I'll bring you guys along in the morning with me and show you what I'm doing here to put it back together. But the more I can get it apart today, the better, because if I can get it all apart today, that means more than likely I'll have it back together tomorrow, and tomorrow's Thursday. So let's see how well this kingpin is going to come out. Like I said, now the widget pin is out, everything else is off. Should be able to just put something here smaller than the kingpin and drive it out. It's moving. It's moving nicely. Okay, I just bought him the hammer out. But that's not a problem because I got a, a piece of round stock here that I usually use for driving the bearings out of to put new uh, seals in the hubs. So I'm going to be a little higher than what the camera's showing with the hammer, but I think you guys got the gist of this. I'm just going to be hammering this steel rod down to drive the kingpin out. There it is. One kingpin removed. Now, a lot of times when I'm changing kingpins, it's because they wore out and they don't come out this easy. But I bought all these parts not knowing if the, how bad the kingpins were. They do have some wear on it. And this truck, like I said, sat for 10 years before I got it. And I mean, on the other side, the wheel bearings falling apart. The races actually look like where the needle bearings on the, or the roller bearings, whatever you want to call them, on the bearings had been sitting, actually rust pitted the, uh, races and you could actually see real well in the seal or the races where the bearings were sitting so I don't know how the components are I don't have a history on this truck before I actually got it except that it sat in a parking lot for 10 years with a tree growing up through it had to cut the tree down to get the truck out so I got all the parts might as well rebuild the steer axle why not it's going to be a lot safer going up and down the road. It should steer better doing all the brakes. It should brake better. Hopefully it won't lock the brake, dry brakes up like it has been. And being a spring suspension, I think that's one of the reasons it locks the brakes up on the back. Now, I'm going to show you how easy it is to move this. But, like I said, this thing is not light. And then again, it may not be so easy should be see now there's shims up here now down below here at the bottom of the axle where the spindle is there's a bearing now if I can get that bearing out it'll give me a gap and it'll make it a lot easier to move this and the all new kingpin sets come with this new bearing so it's not like I'm trying to save the bearing There it is. One bear. See? Like I said, I'm not trying to save it. So it, it's going to wind up in the scrap pin too. I'm not sure. I might go ahead and see about knocking the bushings out. Now that, see how this moves around. And if I'm not careful, it'll wind up on the ground. And then I'll have to try and pick it up. I got a jack stand here to put the tie rod on to try and help keep it from hitting the ground. Remember I told you there's shims up on top. Now we're not going to throw them away even though the new kingpin set comes with new shims. We're just going to set them on the spring axle because like on the other side I wound up using one of the old shims and a new shim just to get it snug. When you go back together with it you want it to be snug want it to be able to turn you don't want it so tight that it's locked up but you don't want to have any play either 
And the next step really isn't all that hard either. There's bushings down in here. It's not exactly like the old new ones. The old ones actually are not spiral bushings. Uh, what's in here right now is called a reaming kit where you, a lot of times you have to knock the bushings out, ream it to get the new ones in. Well, what I'm going back with is called a spiral kit. It's a no ream kit to where the, I'll show you the, one of the bushings here in a few seconds. I have it right be, behind the camera. Okay, see that didn't take long. Now these new bushings here, they're, like I said, they're different than what's in there right now. You know, these here, they don't have anything inside. They're just stainless steel. And as you might be able to see up close here, these lines, it's because they're a spiral. And you can actually twist them down in. Now, what's down in here just has a slit right down through the side. And there's a liner, like a Teflon coating liner inside. And that's all those bushings are. Now, I'm not going to make you guys sit through what's going to be probably an hour worth of fighting with the new bushings to get them out. And I'm just going to take a chisel and I'm going to just keep hammering down in here to get the old bushings out. And then to get the new ones in, I'm just going to take a pair of pliers. I'm going to set the new ones down in there. And then I'm just going to keep twisting this until it goes down in. Now, it does come with seals. Once I get this down in there, I'll go ahead and start the video up again and show you about putting the new seals in. There's a seal that goes in here. There's a seal that goes in down there. And then the new plates, there's O-rings that goes on the plates also. So, okay. Okay, uh, Kaylee got the GoPro working, which is great because it's going to make this a whole lot easier. I went ahead and did a few things. I knew I was going to have problems getting this kingpin in. So it wasn't the pin itself that I had the problem with. It was the bolt because I had to rethread the bolt. So off camera, I already went ahead and put this kingpin in, got the bolt in, and I'm going to explain what I did. You've seen in earlier how I knocked the pin out. And then I told you that I was just going to take a chisel and drive these here bushings out. And like I said, they're just split down the side. So I just took a chisel and I just drove them out. Once I got both of them out, then I just cleaned everything up. As you can see, it's a lot cleaner than it was. And then the new spiral bushings that I showed earlier that are in here, I just went ahead and started spinning them in. Got them in as far as I could with my fingers. And then I took a pair of pliers very carefully on the very top and just continued to spin them in. And then I took the old kingpin to, and used it to get the bushings all the way down in where they needed to go. Now on the other bottom side, I went ahead and put the seal in and put the plate on because it's on the bottom You'd ha and there's not a lot of room to be able to show the camera down there. But it's identical to the top side here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and show you about putting this the seal in up here. Now you got to be real careful. These seals are very thin and it is very easy to mess them up. And you can almost push them in with your hand. But what I do is I get it in here as best I could with my fingers, hold one side and just very gently work with the hammer, get it down in there the best I can with the hammer very carefully and it's smooth now this chisel that I'm going to use as you can see it's not got a sharp edge it's pretty much flat and then you just want to go ahead and finish getting the seal down against the pin very carefully like I said and once you get it all the way down in, then you can put the cap on.
Okay, that's far enough down in. Now, one problem I also had is one of the grease fittings that was in one of the old plates. This grease fitting. When I took it out of the old plate, it just basically went ahead and the spring come out, which made it useless. Well, luckily, I keep these around. It's brand new grease, grease fittings. You can get them there at Harbor Freight. Not a big deal. Now, remember I told you there was a seal and then an O-ring on this kit. Now, the O-ring just goes into this groove right here. It just sits in there. And then go ahead and set it up there. And, like I explained before, a decent kit will come with new bolts, new lock washers for this top plate. And one of the things when you're putting the grease fittings in, you want to be careful of how you get the grease fitting oriented. Because if you turn the grease fitting where it's facing one of these bolts, you're going to have a heck of a time trying to get the grease gun onto the grease fitting. So when you orient it, you want to make sure that you aim the grease fitting in between the bolts otherwise you're going to be coming back with another wrench and trying to turn it later on when you're trying to grease it before you're finished with the job just save yourself some time and effort and just orient it right the first time and i like power tools because they make your job so much easier so much quicker Many, many years ago, and I shouldn't say many, like 20 years ago or so, battery-operated tools sucked. They, batteries, technology has come a long way since then. I know a lot of people still refer, prefer the uh, air tools and that, but honestly, you can do just as much with electric battery operated tools you can with air that bus right over there if you look close inside you'll see an air compressor sitting there i don't use that thing nowhere near as much as i used to because the battery operated tools work so much better now one of the things i also mentioned uh earlier is about these bearings having a problem going on well I had that problem and I w went ahead and spent an hour sanding this surface down with what we call emery cloth. Uh, when I say we, I mean people that work in automotive and repair trucks and all that because it's a basically a sandpaper on cloth. And as you can see, this is 240 grit and I spent some time and sanded this down because this bearing would not go on there before now you don't want it to be sloppy but you want it to slide on without giving it a lot of hassle now you can tap on it a little just to get it loose but you don't want to beat on the bearing now this will go on because i've had it on and off several times i just have to get it perfect now, once it's in the hub, it'll actually orient itself just fine. Come on. It just wants to give me a hassle. Believe me, I've had it on and off, off camera quite a few times. It just wants to be a hassle. Now, the other bearing is here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Now, the way it's supposed to go on is like this one. Just slide on and off without a problem. If it's not sliding on and off like this, or if you can take it and wiggle it, then we got a problem with the uh, spindle, or you got the wrong bearing, something. If it don't go on, then it could be just rust. Something could be... Uh, out of shape I mean there could be many reasons why that it don't want to go on see now that's how it's supposed to go on 
it's just right there where the bearing starts on the bearing surface it's just kind of messed up a little bit i mean we're talking a 1988 truck these are probably the original spindles and i say now i don't want to come back off but as you just seen it it will go on there and off now and something else that i went ahead and did off camera as you can see this area is a lot cleaner than it was and i went ahead and cleaned up the backing plate and the spindle or the spindle and i cleaned up some of the uh, hub now i haven't taken the hub apart yet but i mean to put the kingpin in what i do once i have everything out i put a floor jack underneath the spindle and i put the bearing in the bottom here right here where i'm pointing i put the bearing in there and then i jack up with a uh, floor jack tight and then i take shims like this and i just try and put them in there right there between the spindle and the axle until i find the right amount to where they're hard to go in but they will slide in without beating because you want a tight fit and i did all that and sometimes that can take you an hour but i went ahead and did all that instead of wasting everybody's time and watching me fight with it because this side is harder because like i said before we have two arms we have this arm here and this arm here so you're fighting with the spindle trying to get it where it's perfectly in line for the pin to go in and that can take some time now on the other side you only have this arm here so it's a lot easier to deal with but i went ahead and did all that last night once you get the shims the right amount figured out then you go ahead and take them out drop the jack take the bearing back out then you raise it up get the pin down in with the shims in place and you go ahead and bring the kingpin down into the axle then once you do that you go ahead and get the bearing in most of the time you got to drive it in but you shouldn't have to drive it hard just nice and easy get it in get the pin down in and then you get the wedge bolt in and kingpins in and then you've seen what i did up here you do the same thing down on the bottom and you do it on this side kingpin's all done so now we're ready to move to the backing plate and go ahead and start putting that on one of the things i like about this bus is the wheelchair lift i went ahead and took the arms off to make it more convenient for me but we have the backing plate here already cleaned up what i did is i had a little bit of diesel fuel in a can went ahead and put it in this little tub and then i went ahead and cleaned the backing plate up all the way around cleaned up the spindle the best i could now i haven't knocked the outer brace out i haven't knocked the inner bearing seal any of that stuff out yet we're, we're gonna do that here in a little while but as you can see this bearings and all that's still in there so but right now we're concentrating on the backing plate now the backing plate is only supposed to go on one way and that's there's a few reasons for that okay you've seen how the spindle was before it just sits on the backing plate just sits on there like that and then you go ahead and you turn it to get the bolt holes all to line up and hope it don't fall off while you're doing it and then on this one we have eight bolts washers and lock washers now the way this is designed on this one lock the washers stay on the outside with the bolt 
And of course, I don't have it lined up perfect. You gotta be careful that you don't get your fingers caught in where you don't want them. But once you get the bolts in, it'll stay. Try and get one in with a nut. That way I know it can't fall off. And then I'll go ahead and get another one in on the other side. Because now it's a whole lot easier to handle. Because we got one bolt helping to hold everything. And sometimes the bolts are tight. And you have to work with them. But I'm going to go ahead and get it impact like i said earlier i've been keeping all the tools right here in the back of the bus so they're easy to get a hold of and one thing that i do want to mention i probably mentioned this before when i take the tires off of this truck i use a socket for a three-quarter drive impact and honestly, if whether you're running inner and outer lug nuts or you're running unilug, where you only have one lug nut for each for each set of wheels. Yes, I know there's ten, not one. But on this truck here, you have to take ten nuts off to get the outer wheel off, and then you have to take ten more off to get the inner wheel off on the drives on a lot of the newer trucks you only take 10 off you can take both sets inner and outer tires off but on the unilugs which is where you only take 10 nuts off to take both both tires off if you read the lug nuts they state that they're supposed to be torqued between 450 to 600 foot pounds well a lot of these shops tire shops and that they use one inch impacts and don't get me wrong i have one and right here it is now this impact is rated for over 2,000 foot pounds at 90 psi the air compressor i run it at about 155 psi which probably bumps up the torque to over 3,000 foot pounds well a lot of these shops tire shops and that they think tighter is better so they'll take that one inch impact that's rated for 25, 3,000 foot pounds and put your lug nuts on till the gun stops. Well, like I said, if you look at, at a unilug lug nut or if you look it up on the internet, you'll see that the lug nuts are only supposed to be between 450 and 600. Well, with them putting all, all that pressure on the rim, the studs, the nuts, you wind up with cracked rims, you wind up with broken studs, stripped out threads on studs and nuts and then the tire shops have a habit of saying oh well you had a bad rim or you had a bad stud or you had a bad lug nut but what it boils down to is if they put them on where they're supposed to be you're not going to have a lot of broken rims broken studs stripped threads so if you're getting tires changed somewhere and you're watching them grab one inch impact and they're just hammering on with that impact you you're the boss it's your equipment it's your money you're spending so if you just continue to let them do that you're going to wind up replacing studs lug nuts rims and all that you need to step up and say hey read the lug nuts or get, get with the manufacturer or find the information somewhere or you can have it printed out ready f to show them if it's already stamped on your lug nuts then all you got to do is show them a lug nut but that's going to save you a rim breaking if you driving down the road a rim breaks and especially on the steer you could wreck the truck and kill yourself or somebody else so pay attention when you're getting wheels done especially at tire shops because they love just hammering them on there all right what i'm going to do seeing how some of these don't want to screw in there i'm just going to take the impact here and screw them in easily now remember there's no nuts on the back and these are smooth holes 
so it's not like I'm tightening them up yet. I'm just getting them in because they didn't want to go in. And I'll tell you the honest truth, if you're an owner operator and you want to save yourself some money, you can do what I do. Put a tire and rim on your truck somewhere and carry a, a uh, impact, like a three quarter impact with a socket. Okay, I gotta take that one back out. Gotta be careful because everybody makes mistakes. Where my mistake was here, I didn't put the washer on this one. I seen it on the box. So, there's no nut on it. Comes right out. Not a big deal. But if you're putting somebody on the spot for, like I was saying about tightening lug nuts up, you gotta be decent about it. You can't just be an, uh, nasty and walk up and say, hey, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Walk up to them and be nice about it. I'm sure you can do that. Now, I'm gonna put all the bolts and nuts in here. Where are you at? There, there you are. Before I tighten any of them down. And the reason I'm doing that, the reason I'm gonna put them all in first, is because you might have to move the backing plate around a little bit to get one or two bolts in. And if you tighten them all down first, then that's gonna be a little difficult. So I'm gonna go ahead and get them all in and then start tightening them down. And this gun that I'm using, it's only rated 400 foot pounds, but that's enough for doing these bolts here. Now I do have a battery operated impact and it, that's a way you can go for taking tires on and off. I have a battery operated impact right inside that bus there. That's half inch drive rated at 1200 foot pounds. But now, me, seeing how every tractor trailer on the road is also an air compressor, I do carry in the truck a three-quarter drive impact right there for taking, these, for taking tires on and off. And like I said, I do carry a spare tire mounted ready to go on and I've been out at one o'clock in the morning and this has been a while but I was out one time one o'clock in the morning had a tire come apart and this like I said this has been a long time ago because I haven't been able to work for a while but I went into a Petro thinking okay well I have a spare I'll just have them take the bad tire off and put it on well when I got there to the Petro I was informed that their tire guy was going home and it wouldn't be back until 8 o'clock in the morning I was on the way home I was 30 minutes from the house so I, what I did I just went ahead and found a parking space jacked the truck up used a three-quarter inch impact took that bad tire off took the one off the catwalk Put it on the truck, put the bad one up on the catwalk, strapped it back down, and instead of being stuck out there until the next morning, I was at home by in about an hour and a half, sleeping in my own bed. Now, if you don't care and you're running a truck with a bunk and you just want to sit there and wait for somebody to come in at six, eight hours, that's fine me i'd rather be at the house all right we're just going to go ahead and tighten these up now that we got them all in
Okay. Yeah, remember I said everybody makes mistakes. I didn't put the nuts on some of these bolts, which is not a big deal because they're already in there. And it's not bad to make mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. But one thing also is as long as you can fix your mistake. That's a big thing. Back when I was working on trucks, track trailers, I had helpers. And I, fortunately, I had to leave every one of them go for the same reason. They weren't dependable. They didn't like showing up. They'd show up for the first pay, and then you might not be able to get them for another week. And then they'd call and, well, you got anything? Well, yeah, I had work last week. But couldn't get a hold of them. So... I finally decided that it wasn't worth it. Trying to have a helper and then you schedule jobs you can't do by yourself and you can't get a hold of them and then you have to call and apologize because you can't do the job uh, it's not a one-person job. You wind up start making enough people mad and you're not going to get any phone calls. It's real hard to find good help nowadays. bugs okay backing plates on that that's how simple it is to put the backing plate on all right uh, I can go ahead and slide the s-cam in now because we've got the backing plate on the king pins done and the s-cam has to go in before you can go ahead and uh, Put the uh, brake shoes on and, and all that. Remember, we're changing the uh, slack adjuster. I got that in the back. But, I mean, there's the S-cam. That was fairly simple. We're ready to go ahead and knock the bearing out of the... Uh, the hub the wheelchair lift here it bounces too much to be able to do that so we have an old brake drum or if you're using reusing the brake drums you still have the brake drum so what i like to do is go ahead and set the hub on the brake drum because it gives you a solid surface to work on it's not going to bounce when you hit you get a solid hit now when i clean this stuff up like i said i use diesel fuel to clean it all up and then i went over everything with brake clean to make sure that the diesel fuel was gone because brake clean doesn't leave any kind of residue 
Now, if you're reusing the bearings, you have to be careful when you're beating on the bearings. And watch where you hit. Most of the time, the bearings will come apart, will not come apart and will drive the seal out. I'm not too worried about these bearings because we're putting new ones in, new races and all that. So, that's all it is to get the bearing and the race out. Or bearing and the seal out, I mean. The races are gonna be a lot more difficult. And I'll show them to you here in a few. There's the old seal, the old bearing. Not really seeing anything wrong with these bearings. But I got brand new ones, got brand new races. I'm gonna go ahead and change them because I got the new ones. And I feel better doing it that way. Now, most of the time when I would do a wheel seal, I don't change the bearings and the races but because of what i seen on the other side where the bearing actually physically came apart yes i did do that okay well i'm going to explain how i'm going to take these races out and then i'm going to stop the camera because i'm going to be starting the air compressor up which is noisy i'm going to be using a air chisel air hammer however you want to say it i i got this one from harbor freight you don't always have to buy the expensive tools sometimes you can buy the cheap stuff if especially if you're not going to be using it all the time that air hammer or chisel i might use that maybe once a year so spending a, a few dollars of harbor freight instead of going to max snap on proto whoever you prefer and spending hundreds of dollars on one that works just fine but now what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this air chisel and i'm going to go down there against the race and i'm just going to use the chisel and drive the race out and then i'm going to flip this over and then i'll do the same thing with this race okay we're back all right, I got the seals knocked out, or the races knocked out. As you can see, there's no races left in there. And I told you before, the reason I was doing this is because of the races from the other side. Now, I'm gonna try and show you what I was talking about. I'm hoping it shows up on camera here. But if you look right here, you can see how the races were bad. There's a space there. There's one there. Then if you look at this one, which was the outer one, it's even worse. I'm hoping this shows up on camera. Come on, get it. I'm trying to show this. You can actually see where the rollers had sat. And I'm thinking that's because the thing was sitting for over 10 years. And all the weight and the rust and the weather, well, not so much weather, but time actually cause them to rust in place so we're going to use the these races to drive in the new ones i normally have the tools the proper tools to do it well this is a reason that a lot of mechanics don't loan out tools i had somebody come to me and ask me to borrow some tools a month ago and he was doing a job similar to what I'm doing here. Well, I've been pestering him for over two weeks now, trying to get 
the tools back to do this job with the proper tools. I keep getting the same response from him that he's out of town. He fixed his truck and then he left town. And now that I'm, I actually gave him time to bring me the tools back. Well, I still haven't got them back yet, which kind of upsets me a bit. I was trying to be nice, let him use tools and all that. And it just messes me up. So as you can see, I put the new race in here and I'm taking this race. You'd think that putting on this would work better. Well, the problem is when you do it this way, it's harder to make sure you keep it in line. So this is a way to do it when somebody borrowed your uh, race drivers and haven't brought them back. And you really don't have the money to go buy new tools just because somebody else borrowed them. So now, I just start tapping and keep moving around. You don't want to beat in one place because if you just beat in one place, then it's not going to go down in even. And chances are you'll get cocked and won't want to go in at all. And further you get in, harder you're going to have to drive it. And then every once in a while you take the old race off and you check to see how it's going in. Well, this side here is down in for this side. So that means I got to beat on this side more. Try and get it to straighten out and keep checking. Make sure you get the straighten out. Okay. It's pretty straight now you'll notice down here I got a couple bars on top of the brake drum between the brake drum and the the hub and the reason I did that is because if you just drop it down in the holes of the brake drum it's hard to get the uh, hub back off the brake drum and just like when you're driving the uh, seal and the uh, uh, inner bearing out you want a solid space to be able to pound but you don't want to set the studs on top of the drum because then when you start pounding you take a chance of messing up the studs or possibly driving the studs out of the hub but if you do something like this then you don't have to worry about that so now we got it fairly even we can start working back and forth again and you just keep going until you drive it all the way in Even when it gets flush, it's not all the way in. There's a lip down underneath that it's actually got a seat against. So once it's down in, you got to go even further to hit that lip. It's getting there. And don't worry, if once you get it down in, you'll be able to get the old race back out. I mean, worst case scenario, you just hit it a couple times on the side and the old race will pop up out of the hole because it's not going down in nowhere near as far as the new one. See how I keep bouncing back and forth from one side to the other. And now that it's down to where the old race goes down inside, it's a lot easier to keep them together and once you get it down in far enough you'll notice the sound change when you're hitting it'll become a whole lot more solid of a hit you hear that that's a whole lot more solid so that, that race is all the way down in. So now we're ready to grab the new bearing, which is sitting right over there with the race, and go ahead and drop that in. You'll notice I went ahead and put grease 
on the bearing. I greased it up. I packed, it's called packing the bearing with grease. Now you can't just grab any grease and do that with. Now, a lot of times the reason I do that is for two reasons. One, when you start uh, moving the vehicle after doing a job like this, the uh, bearing is not running dry. Even if there's no oil that got to it yet. That's one. A second reason I do that is because that grease will help keep the oil in there and it won't put as much oil pressure against this these seals which will actually keep them from leaking even longer now all seals that are oil are going to leak because of wear sooner or later because you got this rubber component here spinning on a steel component so you're going to get wear and over time and miles, it's going to wear it down. Now, I normally have a set of seal drivers. And they, they do come in different sizes. Uh, and there's a pole that goes in the center of this hole. But like I said, I went ahead and made a mistake. Let somebody else use some of the tools. Haven't got them back. So the only thing I have as far as my seal drivers, he's got the pole, he's got my other sizes. This is the only size I got left. So what I'm gonna do, and you can do this with a block of wood, a piece of steel, anything as long as you're not beating directly on this seal. These are made out of aluminum. So as long as you take it easy with them, you're not gonna damage the seal. Plus using one of these, you're hitting the entire seal at the same time. Now, you notice I made one hit, one side drop, this side didn't. So that means I gotta continue on this side. Just to get it even. And it's not even yet. Now, just because it's even does not mean it's all the way in. Now that's all the way in. It felt solid. Okay, we're back. Yeah, that was somebody asking me if I could come out and help them out. But I told them I can't. Alright, so now we have the seal in, the inner bearing in, the race and all that. We can go ahead and flip this thing over and put the other race in. And I mean, putting this other race in is pretty much the same as putting that one in. But once this one's in, there's no seal to be able to, that goes in here. Uh, what it is, is once this uh, race is in, the outer bearing goes in here. As you put it, after you put it on the spindle, you put the nut and the, uh, tighten it all down. And then there's, a cap that goes on here that you go ahead and bolt up and that holds the oil in so we're going to go ahead and drive this race in and then we're going to set it on the spindle Ooh, now that's something you want to try and avoid hitting this surface here that's where the proper tools come in handy Sounds like it's down in. I like to take my bare fingers and feel in there. Because when you feel down in there, if it's not all the way in, you'll be able to tell. So you take your fingers. It's even. I don't feel no gap down underneath the race. So that one's in. Plus the sound of it. Sound like it hits solid. So we're good on that. So now we're ready to put the hub on. I'm just gonna set it on there, on the bearing. And then I'm gonna go get my seat. We got to get the uh, outer bearing. And go ahead and set it in there so we can 
shove it all the way on now some people including me sometimes we'll go ahead and put the brakes on before putting the hub on because they'll make it easier but for them for showing you guys what's going on here then you just push the hub up on take the washer and the nut and tighten it up and keep spinning the hub until it feels right i mean i can't tell you exactly how it's supposed to feel you want it to spin you want it to spin freely but you don't you want some drag on it uh there are uh torque specs out there you can look up on the internet and go ahead and find out exactly what the torque specs are but i don't know what they are i've been doing this long enough to where i just put it on and i spin it until it feels good but for right now what i'm going to do so you guys can see what's going on is i'm going to go ahead and pull the hub back off and we're going to go ahead and slap the brake shoes on now normally i'd just go ahead and finish bolting up the hub and all that but you guys are going to be able to see a lot better with the hub off with me putting the brake shoes on so i'm just going to go ahead take it back off set it down on a rag so you guys can see about the brake shoes now they make special tools for putting brake shoes on too on these trucks now the tools i have to do drives don't work on this type so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use a two screwdriver method and i'm going to show you that method here in a minute now because this hit the ground i want to check it out and wipe it off a little bit because you don't want a bunch of dirt and grime in your bearing that's just going to destroy your bearings but we're going to go ahead and put the brake shoes on to where you guys aren't spending an hour watching what i'm doing that's taken me basically uh days to do but brake shoes there's always going to be a pin on these where one side of the brake shoe sits in there and then it just goes ahead and falls over and it's the same thing on the bottom you put it up in there and it goes up in like that now the reason i'm not putting the bottom shoe on yet we got springs that come in a spring kit now when you're doing brakes uh, you're always better off to buy the hardware whether it's for car pickup big truck doesn't matter you're always better off buying the hardware kit with it and the reason is now big trucks are a lot simpler uh the springs any kind of rollers pins they all do wear so when you're doing brakes your brake shoes already wore out more than likely and that's why you're doing the brakes so that hardware especially springs they wear down too and they're going to wear out so you want to replace them put one spring on like i did there and then i swing it around come up underneath the clip like i did here and then i go ahead hook that in that hole and then there's a hole here that this one goes into and you just have to use the screwdriver to get it up okay the gopro died so i had to switch over to the phone here but as you can see i got the hub on tightened up new carter pin i always keep car new carter pins uh, just like uh, I said about the grease fittings, you can go to Harbor Freight and get a bot, uh, assortment of them. Okay, so the next thing is to put this hub cap on. And it's just 
six bolts. And it's kind of hard for me to do this holding the phone, but I'll do my best here. I, I already uh, used gray silicone to make a gasket because the gasket was on it. Of course, when you take it off, it gets destroyed. And the gaskets they sell nowadays, they're not very good anyways. You still got to use silicone with them to get them to seal. So all they are basically is cardboard. So what I'm going to do here, get one of these started in a hole. I hope with one hand. Okay, there's the hole. Once I get one started, then I should be able to get the second one started with one hand. And then it'll be a lot easier to get them in there. And usually I put the silicone on there on whatever I'm siliconing to make gasket and leave it set for a few minutes so it starts to get somewhat rubbery that way it seals better I'm trying to start a bolt with one hand hold the phone with the other hand Let's see if I can use the knee to help hold this in place I'm in the hole. Just get it to start now. Now I got the tripod over here that I'm going to be putting the phone on in a few minutes. I got it set up to where you can see a lot of the other stuff I'm going to be doing. If I can get this bolt to start. Ah, there we go. So you just go ahead and put all six bolts in because that's what it takes on this one is six bolts get them in and then just snug them up one thing you don't want to forget is all these components to take grease or oil whichever it may be you want to make sure you either grease them up or put the oil in them before you move the vehicle Once I get all these started, then I'll be able to hit them with the quarter inch impact with a half inch socket, snug them up, and then I'll tighten them up. All right, I'm gonna put the camera up in the, or the phone up in the tripod. I know you guys can't see the outside of the hub right now, but you can see where I'm gonna be working here in a minute, as soon as I get these bolts snugged up and tightened up. Well, next thing we're going to do is go ahead and put the brake chamber in place. And I'll show you, I don't have that slack adjuster tight or even part, uh, the snap ring on or anything like that. It's just sitting there so I know where it's at. So I'll be able to pull it off and just show you what I'm doing there. We didn't put the brake drum on yet, and I'm going to show you why. Okay, slack adjuster, it just slides on, on these splines. And like I said earlier in the video, the reason we changed the S-cams is so we can go with the automatic slack adjuster where you have this one button here, takes a special tool or screwdriver to pull it out. And then on the bottom here, there's a uh, square nut that you actually do the adjusting with okay once you get that in place the S cams in this is why the drums not on the S cams all the way in you go ahead and figure out how many shims you're going to need and you put them on there and you keep an eye on the groove that the snap ring goes on and you put enough shims on there to where it comes close to the groove for the snap ring and then take a pair of snap ring pliers with a snap ring and you basically just put the snap ring on. If you have a S-cam kit, then you're gonna get a new snap ring with it. 
and you'll get shims and that stuff with it. So now for the brake chamber. Now I was taught long ago, if you're not sure how long that you need the rod, and this is only one of the threaded rods, like this one here, it's got threads all the way up the rod. If you're not sure how far to cut the rod, what you want to do, you want to put your, your brake chamber in place. And I'm just going to put a one bolt and lock washer on here to hold it in place. And I'm going to show you why here in a minute. Okay, now this is what I was told. And it seems like it works pretty good and it makes perfect sense. If you're not sure where to cut your rod, what you want to do is take your clevis with it on your slack adjuster. You bring your brake chamber up and you make sure that this is parallel with this. You're basically wanting a 90 degree between your threaded rod here and your clevis. Once you have that 90 degrees, you'll know where to cut it. Well, I, there's a, usually a nut on these new brake chambers. And what I like to do is where I'm going to be cutting it, I bring the nut up close to where I'm going to be cutting it. That way I can use the nut as a guide to where actually to cut it. And what I usually do is I use a grinder with a cutoff wheel to go ahead and cut it. I cut it right there, I screw this on, I'm going to have my 90 degrees. Okay. Now I can take the clevis back out, set it aside, and I got room here where I can actually work. Now, like I said, I like to use a grinder with a cutoff wheel to do this. Cutting the rod is just that simple. And I found that the grinder with the cutoff wheel is really the easiest way to do it. Now, we actually have the nut still on there. So, because we just made a cut, the end of the threaded rod is normally a little boogered up. And it's still warm from the cut. But you can work the nut because it's down below the cut back and forth to straighten out any messed up threads. Take your clevis, go ahead and screw it on. Now you now when you look at your clevis you can see the holes all the way through. You don't want the threaded rod sticking all the way through because then you take a chance of it actually hitting the slack adjuster and giving you a problem with the slack adjuster moving. And you don't want your slack adjuster getting bound up because that's going to cause you a problem with braking. But if you can, the best thing to do is bring the threaded rod close to the end where it's almost sticking out but not quite. And that's why the cut is so critical. And then once you get it in place, of course you can't just flip it up there. So you take that one nut that you put on there to hold it in place off. You can pull it out, slide over. And stick it in the holes. Now your brake chamber is actually on the bracket. And you can actually put your pin in. You don't have to put the pin in right this second, but you can. And it's actually connected. I mean, you still got to tighten down this one nut. It's called a jam nut. You want to make sure it's tight so your rod in the brake chamber cannot spin because your rod is capable of spinning inside the brake chamber. 
but you don't want it threading in or out of the clevis after you get it mounted. So that's why the jam nut. Another reason that I kept the brake drum off is that way I could move this to make sure the brakes were at the lowest point. So the brake drum will go on and that's where you want your brakes pulled in as far as they'll go when you go for this 90 degrees. So now the only thing we got to do is you see there's a clevis there. You got one pin and the self-adjusting style has a second pin that actually goes into this rod here that allows it to actually adjust. I'm not going to waste your time with uh, showing you me putting both pins in, putting quarter keys in, tightening this down. Uh, I'll, sit, I'll do that all off camera. Next thing is you need to be able to provide air, pot, air to the brake chamber and that's done by the brake hose and there's a coupler. Now when you put a coupler into a brake chamber or anything that is not a compression fitting, one of the things you want to do is use Teflon or, or something equivalent to it to coat the threads because if you don't do that then when you put it in you take a huge chance of it leaking air and I mean if you drive a truck you know DOT will rate you up for any kind of air leak so the last thing you want to do is have an air leak so use Teflon uh, they sell it in the liquid form I prefer they also sell it in the tape I like the liquid because it doesn't you don't have to work, think about which direction you're going to spin the tape on there plus the liquid seem you can get it a lot more and you can use a lot less of it it lasts a lot longer I just found that the liquid works for me a lot better plus it's in a big enough container where I'm not searching for it it's like where'd that roll tape go but now it's just tighten up the fitting on the back of the brake chamber with a wrench put your airline on there put your other nut on the brake chamber and slide the drum on make sure you grease everything up don't forget to do that you want grease and oil where it belongs and then put the wheel on.